All you got to do is pick the right players and you'll be a best ball winner, they say. Well, my friends, that is not a strategy. That is a result. Real winners in best ball focus on the process that goes into picking those players that net you the wins. But how does one create a best ball winning strategy? Let's talk. One of the key factors that I think goes often overlooked in best ball drafts is positional strength. Am I grabbing someone in the draft at a high cost that has unlimited potential at a weak position? If so, go for it. Swing early if you have to. Get that player. But are you targeting somebody in the draft that maybe has some type of cap scoring ceiling and there also happens to be more players in the draft later that have a similar scoring ceiling and range? And on top of that, and I want to add a higher probability of hitting their potential, well then if so, don't target that player. And it seems like it's a very easy strategy to cover and to follow, but not everybody does it. Focus on the positional strength. Is there a scarcity of upside type players at the position? And if not, if there are many players with similar scoring ranges, don't grab one of the first players at the position in that range. Get one of the guys at the end. They're all going to be volatile, so embrace the volatility. Number two, upside is everything. I'm not drafting players like Larry Fitzgerald in best ball. Does that mean I'll have zero shares of Larry Fitz in best ball? No, not at all. I'm going to stay water. You've heard that term before. you got to be able to move with the draft. Don't move against it. So will there be times when you end up on players that might have a cap ceiling? Sure, everybody is a value at some point. But your goal going into the draft should be to aim at those higher up side picks. Now, where there is fear in best ball, there is opportunity. Often you get those guys that people are afraid of for X, Y, and Z injuries, changing teams, quarterback uh, issues, whatever it might be. Those players sometimes are the ones that end up as the best ball winning selections. So don't feed into the fear going into your best ball drafts. Embrace the volatility. It's the second time I've said it, and it matters, especially in best ball, just like it does in DFS, my friends. Use best ball rankings to your advantage and then leverage them. That's right. Leverage these. So a lot of these sites that you're doing these best ball drafts on and a lot of the content providing sites out there are giving people a very similar best ball ranking or showing them the average draft position. Now, you can use those to your advantage by identifying where the common player is choosing player A, B, or C, and then leverage it. If there's someone on that list that you think is the key to winning your best ball draft, and you can get them in round five, well, you might have to take them in round four or even as early as round three. But if you think they are the winning pick, do not feed into the fear and embrace the volatility. Once again, I want you to grab that player early. Now, if it is somebody later in the draft who's going way too early, maybe round eight, but you have pegged them as an 11th or 12th round value, don't feel like you have to use your 8th or ninth round pick on that player. Take him as a value in round 11 as you've targeted him, and if he goes before that, so what? Stay water, move with the draft. And speaking of those later round picks like that, Ah, position scarcity is everything to me. This is a very overlooked factor, much like our first one, which was positional strength. Not only strength being an issue, but scarcity being an issue. Is the position strong? Are there a few guys with massive upside? Okay, cool. That's great. But what about the scarcity? Outside of those few picks, is there a steep drop-off? Think of the tight end position. Every single year, we get two or three guys, elite tight ends. After that, significant drop-off. Those are the types of positions where if I don't get that first person nice and early, I'm gobbling up many of the later picks rather than targeting the volatile mid-round picks. I think that while the mid-round picks probably have a little bit higher scoring ceiling week to week, I can get several, three or four of those later picks where I only need one per week to likely hit the same-ish scoring ceiling as the mid-round value, tight end that somebody else took. Instead, I'm going to use that mid-round pick on a higher upside wide receiver or a higher upside running back when they are taking that weaker running back or wide receiver later when you're taking your weak tight end picks. Listen, tight end value is inherently tied to touchdowns for the most part. So you can grab those late three or four picks and you're just hoping for a touchdown each week, put you in the green, get you through to the next week. By the way, I have a bunch of promo links down below in the description section. 
I believe there's three of them at the top of the description. Please grab those. If you want to support free content here on Donuts Talk Sports, please, by all means, grab those links. Use the promo link. Use the promo code. That supports me and allows me to continue to do free things for YouTube and Twitch and the company and everything else. So please grab those links and hit that sub button and notification bell for my daily streams as well right here on YouTube. All right, best ball depth. This is the time, the moment you've all been waiting for. What to do with your depth? Well, I'm going to put together quarterback and tight end in the same category. I think if you grab one of those elite pass catchers or the elite arms at the top end of your draft, then you really only need one later in the draft. You could potentially add a third if you need them, or if you just have an abundance of value at the other positions, and you're like, you know what, I'm going to get some depth here just in case somebody gets hurt. Go ahead. But if you don't grab one of those elite Patrick Mahomes or George Kittle uh, arms or catchers, uh, my friends, just skip the entire mid-tier. Go to the back end of your draft and grab three or four depth arms and catchers, pass catchers. So at tight end, you're looking for guys that are inherently tied to touchdowns. All right, That's where a lot of the tight ends get their value from anyways. You can grab three or four late tight ends that you're hoping at least one per week can score a touchdown. You know, most tight ends will score two to three per season at this range. And honestly, I mean, that's 12 touchdowns over 16 weeks or so. You can get there by having at least just one of them have an above average season, you know, scoring five or six on the year. And that can be the guy who wins you your best ball league at quarterback. Same thing outside those top 12 arms. Who cares? Just grab anybody with an upside. Big Ben last year was that type of guy. There are many guys like that. You can grab uh, many quarterbacks who are going to have these types of games where they throw four touchdowns and 400 yards and then they go through a game or two where they throw less than 200 and don't even throw a touchdown. Another guy like Ryan Fitzpatrick. There's arms everywhere that are like that in the NFL. Boomer bust. I am targeting boomer bust quarterbacks outside of the Patrick Mahomes-esque uh, tier. And same thing at tight end. If you're not grabbing the Kittles of the world, you're going or the Kittles and Kelseys, you're going to skip the next you know, half dozen or so tight ends and just grab the back end of the draft uh, tight ends and hope to secure somebody who steps up and takes a step forward in year three or year four at tight end. Now, running backs, I try to grab at least four of my top 10 picks. And one of those four, I want at the front end of the draft. I don't think the scoring ceiling is as high with the back end running backs, but I do think at wide receiver, you have a ton of wide receivers outside the top 25 or so taken that have a very similar scoring ceiling. Now, do they have the same probability of hitting that ceiling? No. Each and every week, a lot of them are extremely volatile, which is why I want to gobble up as many of them as I can. I will likely aim for 8 to 10 on virtually every single best ball site that I play on this year. And I will try to get as many of the players that people are fearful of. I not only want to focus on the opportunity of grabbing these players at a value because they'll have dipped in the draft, fallen in the draft because of that fear, but I want to embrace that volatility and hope that the upside is worth it. So again, quarterbacks, not one of the elite ones, tight ends, not one of the elite ones, grab three or four later. Running backs, I want four in the top 10. That's for me this year in 2021. And at wide receivers, I'm trying to get as many as I can. Eight to 10 is the goal. And I'm going to be targeting the guys in the later to middle rounds of the draft. Now, best ball is incredibly fun, very rewarding, and I'm going to be focusing on it a ton over the next several months leading up to week one of the NFL season. Down below the description section, please grab those links. They allow me to continue to do what I'm doing today. And uh, I hope you enjoyed this. I'm going to be pumping out a ton of fantasy football content. The fantasy football draft kit down below in the description section is uh, one venti coffee, depending on where you're going. That is the value. And it also includes some promos to some very reputable uh, other fantasy football sites and some DFS companies I'm a part of, including a betting company. So give them a look down below the description section. You'll see the 2021 ROF draft kit. Take care, my friends.